Take your Bible this morning, once you get two verses of scripture for me, Hebrews chapter 11, if you would, and then pick up Galatians chapter 2, Hebrews 11 and Galatians chapter 2. Hebrews 11, we're going to read verse 6 together, and then over in Galatians chapter 2, we'll read verse 20 together. Hebrews 11, verse 6, and then we'll turn over and read Hebrew, or Galatians 2 and verse 20, and we'll read these verses together. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11. Ready? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then Galatians 2 and verse number 20. Ready? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture uh, here this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to make our hearts ready, that we'd be prepared to receive the truth from your word this morning. Lord, I pray that all of our hearts would be good soil, that the word of God could fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. And so, Lord, meet with us and speak to our hearts today as only you can. Bless the special. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. Embrace the cross where Jesus suffered, though it will cost all you claim as yours. Your sacrifice will seem small beside the treasure. Eternity can't measure what Jesus holds in store. Embrace the love the cross requires. Cling to the one whose heart knew every pain. Receive from Jesus fountains of compassion. Only he can fashion your heart to move as he is. Oh, wondrous God, so Jesus rest in you. Oh, Lord Jesus, make us bolder to face with courage the shame and disgrace you bore upon your shoulders. Embrace the life that comes from dying. Come trace the steps. Savior walked for you. An empty tomb concludes Golgotha's sorrow. Endure then till tomorrow your cross of suffering. Embrace the cross. Embrace the cross. The cross of Jesus.
Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now, and we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to open up your word this morning. Thank you for the good music we've heard today, and Lord, thank you for already uh, speaking to our hearts, and thank you for the wonderful testimony from Emily. Lord, what you're doing in her life and your guidance and your leadership. We thank you, Lord, that even as a young lady, she's waiting on you and allowing you to open the right doors for her uh, to be able to move and uh, to go forward in her training. And Lord, I pray you'll continue to do so. Now, Lord, we pray that you'll open our understanding as we look into your word this morning. I need your help desperately this morning. I pray that what I say will be clear. I pray it'll be understandable. I pray it'll be helpful to the people of God this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The two verses of Scripture we read this morning in Hebrews 11 and also Galatians chapter 2, both deal with faith. Uh, the one in Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to do what? Please God. Can't please God without faith. And uh, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then Galatians tells us that not only do we have saving faith, but we have sustaining faith. We have a faith that helps us live for God and a faith that helps us to be able to do what God wants us to do. Uh, notice it says in Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I not, The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. And so we're, we're living by His faith. Knowing what Christ did for me does not produce change. Knowing what Christ has done does not produce change in your life. Okay? Faith produces change. Faith produces change. Faith in Christ's substitutionary death for me on the cross. Faith that believes that Christ became sin for me and when He knew no sin, that I could have the righteousness of God in me, that if I put my faith in Jesus Christ and what He's done for me, that my sin is transferred to Him and His righteousness is transferred to me. And I get to go to heaven not on my righteousness, but on His righteousness. That's faith. Faith for what the Bible calls justification. That's faith for salvation. But then, there's a faith in Galatians 2.20 that talks about Christ's placement in me. Colossians says that Christ dwells in our hearts by faith. That He takes up residence inside of us. And, and His placement in our lives at salvation is sanctification. The, you're, you're, not, you're not saved by faith and sanctified by works. Okay, You're not saved through uh, faith alone, no works of your own, but sanctified by no faith and all works of your own. That's not true. You're sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ, who now dwells in us and His placement in our life. So Christ's placement in me provides me with sanctification. It's faith that saves, and it's faith that produces change in my life. Have faith in God. We're going to look at that a little bit this morning. The faith, listen, the faith is not in ourselves. The faith is not in our church. The faith is not in what we do. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. He's the only one that deserves the object of our faith. Why? He loved me and gave Himself for me. That's why He's worthy of my faith. Now, what exactly is faith? Someone said faith is obeying God's revealed will at all times. Okay, that's true. Someone else says no, faith is taking God at His word. That's true. I heard this week at the conference, somebody said, faith is forsaking all I take Him. That's true. Uh, forsaking all I trust Him. That's true. If you like acrostics, th th those are all good. But, but I think there, there, there might be two different measurements for faith because you have a faith that saves and you have a faith that sustains or a faith that changes you. For by grace are ye saved through faith. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith for salvation. Now, let me give you a definition for faith, and it's not original with us. It's, it's, a, it's a definition that goes with the RU program, and I believe it's accurate. Faith is the personal measurement 
of the level of confidence of what Christ has done and will do in, through, and for me. It's a personal measurement of the level of confidence. Faith, in other words, faith is it's, it's a measuring of my personal confidence in Christ and what He has done and what He will do in me, through me, and for me. That's how I measure my faith. That's what faith is. It's that personal measurement. You say, well, I don't have much faith. Well, God can grow your faith. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But I want you to know that, in other words, you're saying, I'm going to do this because I believe the result will be exactly as God said it would be. I'm going to step out and obey this command of the Bible because I believe the end result will be just exactly what God said it would be. I will believe God. You give, you give a certain percentage of your income, whether it's 10% or 15% or 20%, whatever it is, and you're saying, I believe that God will have what's left over go further than if I kept all 100%. You're just going to believe God and take God at His word. You see, that's faith. Now, the disciples are learning this, and I want you to turn to Mark chapter 11. Would you look there, please, with me? Mark chapter 11. Mark 11, notice with me in verse number 12. And on the morrow, if you would, is this on low? If it is, it should be medium. Would you check that, John? Make sure this fan's on medium, John or Don, either one. Thank you. Verse 12, notice, on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, that's Jesus. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Okay, they go into Jerusalem. The yeah, Lord does some things there. Notice down to verse 20. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold. I think you heard something about behold Wednesday night, didn't you? Behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, What did he say to him, church? Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Wow. What they're doing here is, listen, they're seeing Jesus do the unbelievable. Did you miss it in verse number 14? When Jesus curses the fig tree and said, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever, that last sentence gives us some important information. And his disciples heard it. He cursed the fig tree and they heard him say it. Then why is Peter astonished when he comes across it the next day and he says, Master, hey, that fig tree you cursed, look at it, man, it's all shriveled up. Wow! He was just amazed that Jesus' word came to pass. What was, what was Jesus trying to teach His disciples? Would you have faith in Me? Would you trust My word? Would you have faith and confidence in what Jesus says? Why would we doubt what Jesus says? You can be... You can be sick and, and you'll go to a doctor who you may know very well and you may not know very well and he'll, he'll scribble something on a piece of paper that you can't even read and you'll take it to a pharmacy that you don't know and people you hope are reading it right and they'll give you a bottle of whatever it is and you'll take it because you've got faith in all those people. Well, why don't you have faith in what God says? Why don't you have faith in what Jesus says? 
He's teaching the disciples to have faith in God. We're accepted by God when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's how you have assurance of salvation. It's because, I'm listen, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you call upon the name of the Lord and ask Jesus to save you? Yes, you did. Then you are saved because he said so. End of discussion. End of discussion. I'm not accepted by what I do. I'm not disqualified by what I do. It's by faith in what Jesus has done. And I put my faith in Him. And so, faith is, is having the, 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 the personal measurement of my level of confidence in what Christ has done and will do in, through, and for me. Jesus can do the unbelievable. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, faith depends on its object. You've heard me talk about this before. Many people say they have faith. Well, faith in what? What do you have your faith in? Well, I got faith in my faith. Well, you're in bad shape. You're in bad way. Faith is 100% dependent on the object in which you're placing your faith. Almost every Thursday night, I think, I use the illustration, and the guys who go to the prison probably get tired, but it, it illustrates salvation so well. I tell them that, that you, you come in and you sit in that chair. You know why? Because you trust the chair. i never seen one of those guys yet. Walk in, pick the chair up, turn it upside down, check the screws, check everything tight, make sure it's good before they sit down in it. They just walk in and <laughs> down they go. They trust the chair. And salvation is when you put all your weight on Jesus Christ and say, I'm trusting what he has done for me to give me the gift of eternal life and take me to heaven one day. Faith is has to be in the right object. And the faith for salvation, the object, is Jesus Christ. Your faith has to be in Him. Now, as a believer, as I progress in my faith, my faith is in God. What do I have to believe? I have to believe God knows what He's doing. I want to go to India. But God said no. Emily didn't say, well, too bad, I'm going to find a way to go. She didn't say that. She figures God knows best. And so she waits and sees, what do, well, maybe this door will open. And God said no. And then he showed her what direction he wants her to go. See, God's not in the business of trying to hide his will. But oftentimes, I tell you what, he's not going to catch up to us and chase us down to show us his will. We, we get running and going, and we, we run down the way. We're running for God, and we say, God, you coming? Come on. Let's go. No, 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 no. Don't, don't get caught up in that. Faith in God. That God knows what He's doing. God's system of managing my life. Our faith. So many believers have faith in Christ to save them. But they don't have any faith in Christ to lead them. To guide them in their life. To take them through sanctification. Now, I've said this before and I'll say it again this morning. The, the, the depth of your faith is determined by how well you know the object or the person you place your faith in. The depth of your faith is determined by how well you know the object or the person that you place your faith in. We know that if you want more faith, you have to increase your faith, you have to increase your knowledge in the object that you want more faith in. If I want more faith in God, I have to get to know God better. The more I know God, the more I'll put my faith in God. You didn't. The, the reason that many people don't put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior is because no one's ever told them that's what they should do. There are, there are multiplied billions of people in the world that don't know to call on Jesus and ask Him to be their Savior. They don't have any idea. That no one's ever, has anyone ever taken a Bible and showed you from the Bible how you can know for sure that when you die you'll go to heaven? You know, most people will say no, nobody's ever done that. No one's ever done that. So they don't know. And so they can't put their faith in something that they don't know. The reason you got saved was somebody was able to show you from the Bible how your faith needs to be in Christ, and you said, I believe that. And I'll put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. And I trust Him as my Savior. 
And so you, you grow then, and you, your knowledge of God grows as you grow under the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And so your faith begins to grow, and that causes your faith in God to grow. Why? Because you're getting to know God better. Best thing a new Christian can do is, it, outside of reading their Bible every day, spending time with God every day, is be in church every time the doors are open. If you're a new believer here, let me encourage you to be here Sunday morning, be here Sunday night, be here Wednesday night. Sunrise east, sets in the west, two plus two is four, water runs downhill, I go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Just make it part of the fabric of your life. Make it part of your routine, part of who you are. And you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. And you know why God will do something in your life? Because you'll trust Him. Because you'll get to know Him. And when you know Him, you'll trust Him. Again, somebody may ask you for a dollar and you'll give them a dollar. That's no big deal. But if somebody asks to borrow a thousand dollars from you, well, wait a minute. It's a different story. Especially if I don't know you. You have to be willing, if I'm going to give you a thousand dollars, you'd have to make the, the mind up, I, I'm going to give it to you with the idea I've never seen it again. Or, I know you well enough when you say, I'll pay you back by such such a date, I know you well enough that you'll be good for it. And I'll give you the money. Don't come up to me after service and say, Pastor, give me a thousand dollars, okay? I know how you think. Many people have little faith in God because they know so little about Him. You know so little about Him. You don't trust Him because you don't know Him. You, 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 you seldom read the Bible. You look for your Bible at church on Sunday. When time, time to go to church. Where's my Bible? Anybody seen my Bible? Huh? And we go find it and get it in the car so we can walk in. Everybody thinks we're, we think we're spiritual because we carry our Bible, but we haven't cracked it open since last Sunday. See? We wonder why we don't have any confidence in God. Because you don't know Him. You don't know Him. You haven't grown in your knowledge of Him. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the whole idea behind giving. How can you give? How can you give sacrificially and give generously and give as the Macedonian Christians did, even in their poverty, give greatly? Because they knew God. They knew that God would keep His Word. They knew that God's able to make all grace abound toward them. And so they could give generously because they had confidence in God. What makes it hard to give is if you don't have much confidence, much faith in God. Now I want you to go to John chapter 11. Mark 11. Look at John 11. You're never going to sacrifice to God more than you trust God. You're never going to sacrifice to God more than you trust God. Now look at John 11. We, we saw in Luke 11, or Mark 11 that Jesus did the unbelievable with the fig tree. But here in John 11, what happens in John 11 is Lazarus is sick. And when Jesus gets the word that Lazarus is sick, he stays in the same place for two days until he even begins to move. And by the time he gets there, here's what happens. Let's see, Jesus, verse 17. When Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. He was Lazarus. Bethany was nine to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. Mary sat still in the house. Then Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. You know, can we translate that? Lord, where you been? Where you been? I mean, it, it would have been different if you'd have just come right away. Where have you been? Has God ever not been fast enough for you? God ever been too slow for you? You get a little upset? But, she says this, but I know that even now, whatsoever thou would ask of God, God will give it to thee. And so Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha said, Well, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. You know what he's saying? Martha, the resurrection isn't a day. The resurrection's a person. And I am the resurrection and the life. That's what Jesus is saying. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she so said, she went away, called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master's come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She go to the grave to weep. When Mary was come where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying, Lord... If thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. We heard that before, didn't we? When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved them. And some of them said, could not, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind and cause even this man that, she, that he should not have died? Jesus himself, or Jesus therefore again groaned in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, uh, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people that stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, and saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. And many of the Jews which came to Mary and had sent, seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. He did the impossible. He raised somebody from the dead. He raised somebody from the dead. Listen, it, don't get upset if, if Jesus hasn't done something that you thought He should have done. We're, we're real good at not just uh, taking our need to God or trying to ask God to, to help us with something. We kind of get it figured out how God should do it too. How it should happen. And then if it doesn't come about that way, we kind of get upset with God. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it would have been better for Jesus to have been there and kept him from dying? Or do you think it would be more exciting to have him bring him back from the dead? Walk out of the grave. And, and by the way, nobody said he stunk. Okay? If Jesus can bring him back from the dead, he's able to take away the stink. Amen? That's not a big deal. And so he brought him back from the dead. How much greater is it? Not, listen, they could have said, if he was just sick and he didn't die, they could have said, well, he wasn't that sick. He just he wasn't as sick as what they, they were letting on he was. But they can't deny he was dead. Four days. Four days he's in the grave. And they watched him walk out. Faith in God. Over and over you see the Lord telling them, didn't I say if you'd believe? Didn't I say if you'd have faith, you could see the impossible? That power that raised Lazarus from the dead, that power that raised up Jesus from the dead, that power is in you and me. It's the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And He indwells every believer. You see, it's what God can do in us and through us. Oh, most Christians don't have a problem believing the Bible. You believe, you believe what the Bible says, and you believe the miracles, and you believe the amazing things that people did in the Bible. But when somebody says, but will God do amazing things in you and through your life? Oh, well, no, not me. I don't see God anything big with my life. Oh, my. Have faith in God, my friend. No, these are, these are ordinary people. Have faith in God. He tells us, Something we need to change or a habit that needs to be broken and we say, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I can't do that, God. 
That's too hard. And we choose our will over his will. And at that moment, you stopped exercising faith. And you started doing what you wanted to do. If you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You see, sometimes we want God to favor us before we increase our faith in Him. But it works the other way around. The Bible never says seeing is believing. Missouri says that. But the Bible doesn't say that. What does the Bible say? Believe and thou shalt see. Believing is seeing. Why? Because without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Believe and thou shalt see. You see, faith is an action word, not a passive word. Faith says, I'm going to do what's right. James put it this way. He said, show me your faith by your works. In other words, our outward actions reveal our inner faith. Now, it's just the, the works there simply means effort. Effort doesn't save us and effort doesn't change us, but effort is a byproduct of our faith. Faith without effort is dead. Okay? Matthew 14, when Jesus comes walking to the disciples on the water. You know, familiar with the story? There's one disciple. What was his name? Peter. Hey, that looks, man, that looks cool. Let me come walk to you on the water. And you know what Jesus said? Come on. And he jumped out of the boat when it was still storming. When the waves are still rolling, the lightning's still flashing, the wind's still blowing, Peter jumps out and starts walking on the water. I'm sure there had to be other guys murmuring, wouldn't you? What's he doing now? What, what kind of a... Huh? And there he is, walking on the water. The only other man besides Jesus to do that. And, and when he finally took his eyes off Jesus, he saw the waves, he saw the wind, he saw everything going on, and he began to sink. And he cries out, Lord, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and he pulls him up. He never rebuked him for getting out of the boat and walking on the water and showing that kind of faith. He never rebuked him for that. It, he, he got to do something that no one else ever got to do. And by the way, anytime you take your eyes off Christ and you start looking at your circumstances and looking at all the other things except Christ, you'll sink as well you'll sink as well. And, and it, Jesus said, Wherefore didst thou doubt, O ye of little faith? Oh, you lost your faith in me. Wonder, what things could you accomplish? What things could God do in you and through you if you just keep your eyes on Christ and rely upon Him? I would tell you He could do the impossible. We saw a little skit while we were there that the Worldview team put on one of the sessions. And uh, one of them was about Adoniram Judson in Burma, how he labored for seven years translating the scriptures, what he was doing, trying to get something in their language. Seven years with no convert. Seven years he couldn't write home and say, had anybody saved? And what happened was, finally, he had a fellow who began to work for him. He gave him a job to work for him who had been a murderer. He killed people. And one day, he was getting in fights all the time, and people brought him to him, and finally he said, that's it, that's the last straw, and I'm, I'm letting you go. And this young man said, please don't let me go. And he begged for mercy. And Adam Judson took the scriptures he had and knelt down with that young man and showed him how to be saved. And that man got saved. And it was that man who took the scriptures to his people and had thousands come to Christ as a result. A man who'd been a murderer. Sounds like the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? I met a man who was a at the conference, who's a, who's a pastor now, 
Actually, I think he's an evangelist. And he was at the conference. He, he was telling me after one of the sessions, he was a Hindu priest. All kinds of gods. And, and he heard the gospel. And he accepted Christ as a savior. Twelve years ago. He has a wife now and two daughters, and they're all saved. He said in those 12 years, the Lord has allowed him to, to see saved and baptized 500 Hindu converts in 12 years. What's, what's your excuse again? Why is it that God couldn't use you? God can do the impossible. He, he loves to do the impossible. I want you to go to Luke 11. You were in Mark 11, where God did the unbelievable, and you were in John 11, where he did the impossible. Look at Luke 11. In Luke 11, another illustration about prayer and faith in God that Jesus gives. Notice verse 5. Are you okay? Are you all right? We're almost, we're almost done. And he said unto him, he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. And I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he's his friend, yet because of his importunity. Importunity means constant begging. He will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For every one that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? If he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Here we see Jesus says in prayer, by faith you can get the unusual. You can get the unusual. Lend me three loaves. No, it's midnight. Everybody's in bed. Get out of here. Go away. Hey, I need three loaves. I told you, we're in bed. Get out of here. No. No. I'll tell you what happened. His wife said, if we're getting any sleep, give him some loaves of bread. Huh? He said, okay. He said he gave it to him. Listen, not because he's his friend. You're not getting your prayer answered because God likes you so much. You're not getting your prayers answered because you're his favorite or you're his pet. No, he gets it from those who will ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and keep on asking and seek and seek and seek and seek and keep on seeking and knock and knock and knock and keep on knocking. Listen, we often hear, we often hear God has three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and maybe or wait. Now I want you to look at this, what Jesus is teaching here. And he said, ask and ask and ask and it shall be given you. Seek and seek and seek and keep on seeking. You'll find knock and knock and knock and knock and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. Well, wait a minute, where's the, where's the no and the wait a while? Wait a minute. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh. But you see, it's that importunity. It's that constant begging to God. We don't want to pray that way. I've learned something through the years. I know that may surprise you. But when people come to my office and say, we've really prayed about this. That isn't always the case. If you really probed a little deeper and said, well, just exactly how much have you been praying about this? Can you tell me? 
Well, it turns out about three days they prayed about it. Or two last two days. That's really praying about it. One thing I learned that you learn real quick if you travel into other countries. We are in a hurry. Americans do everything fast. And buddy, we want it now. These, one of the hardest things that you had to, to, to get over to India in the conference is slow down. These guys have tea time. That's, to me, that's, let's play 18. <laughs> tea time, you know. Uh, that's the tea time I'm talking about. They have tea time. Okay. And you know what they do? They just love to stand and talk. They love to stand and talk. Now, Dr. Cherian runs a tight ship, and he says, we're going to start at 10 o'clock. You be in here at 10 o'clock. And most of them make it, but there's always a few scraggling in. They're just not in a hurry. They're not in a hurry. And sometimes our Americanism gets into our prayer life, and we get in such a hurry, we don't want to keep on asking. We don't want to keep on seeking. We don't want to keep on knocking. So to cover our lack of importunity, we came up with a little formula to say, well, God said no. Did this guy leave after knocking one, two, three, four times and say, well, he said no. No, he kept on knocking. What prayers have you given up on thinking that God said no? See, God will redirect it, but God's going to answer. That's Emily's testimony as she continues to pray and continues to seek. You know what God did? He directed her to the place he wants her to go. But she didn't say, well, that door closed in India. I don't know anybody there. I guess I'm not supposed to go anywhere. God said no. No. God absolutely wanted her to be somewhere. But she had to keep on asking. Notice this fella, he's, what he's asking for is not something for himself. A friend has come to me in his journey and I have nothing to set before him. He's asking for bread for somebody else. He's asking to be a blessing to someone else in their travels. The importunity here was that he could help someone else. The, the answer to the prayer was not just for himself, but for others. Do you know God loves it when you, by faith, do something for others? The Bible says in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs, that, or the book of Psalms, that he that gives to the poor lends it to the Lord. And that which he's given will he repay him again? That's a pretty good promise. God says, you give it to the poor. You give it for others. And God says, I'll see to it that you're lending it to me and I will pay you again. And God pays with pretty good interest. Every time. Luke says, it's good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Will men give into our bosom? You see, the money that you collect on uh, today, March the 5th, listen, it's, it's for uh, better windows in the apartment, so when we have cold weather or hot weather, the missionaries we keep there aren't hot or cold. They can be comfortable. We can have a nice place for them and treat the servants of the Lord right. To help a young lady go to the mission field, to help another young lady who's struggling with addictions. You see, it's not, it's not money for us. It's not money for ourselves. It's money for others. I'm thankful for, through the years, how God has touched your heart to give money for buses, for remodeling, for missions conferences, for big days, for mission trips. Dr. Cherian, I'll share some more things tonight, but we, he took us on a tour Friday of their Christian Academy. They have the South India Baptist Bible College there. They have 406 students enrolled there right now. And there's a Baptist Academy that is just outside the gate to the college to the left. And they've got, I think, five acres of land there. And he's built a school that has two floors, and they got the rebar up now for the third floor. They have 468 students in their Christian school there. Majority of them Hindu boys and girls. That they, are, they let them in and they let them know uh, that they're 
I, I have a video. I don't know if I can be able to get it for you, but I have a video of all those kids gathered around and they all sang to God be the glory for us. It was such a blessing. He was telling us the story about that property. A Hindu man owned the property. He wanted it for his, the, Dr. Charyan wanted it for his Christian school and he approached the man and the man said, I will never sell this property to you. Oh, he shouldn't have said that. You ever tell God what you'll never do? Hmm? See how that works out for you? Here's what Dr. Charyan did. He continued to pray. He said he went and got a cornerstone. And he went to his property, which was right next to the property he wanted, property of the college. He got right on the fence line. He said, and I laid the cornerstone for that academy, believing that when God gave us the land, I'd pick it up and move that cornerstone to the building. But I believed God was going to give us that property. He said, I laid the cornerstone, and for three years, nothing. Oh, hmm? well, God said no. No, he kept on praying every day. The fellow approached him after three years. You still interested in buying the property? Yes, I am. He ended up getting that property. I think he said it was like $20,000 an acre. The property that today is worth $400,000 an acre. He said the guy won't even speak to him today. <laughs> and, uh, he's not real happy with it. How did he, how'd he get that land? Faith in God. Faith in God. You have faith that the Lord shed His blood for your salvation and His righteousness. and You have faith for our sanctification, which means that you can overcome sin. You can overcome the power of sin in your life. The new identity you have is Christ in me, the hope of glory. Christ lives in you, Galatians 2.20. Do you believe what Jesus said in Mark 9 and verse 23, that all things are possible to them that believe? What the choir is saying today, that nothing is impossible when you put your faith in God. It's, a, it's just amazing to me. They do a, just, just the things by faith. I'm going to talk about a lot of the things with India tonight. I won't take them all now. But I just want to encourage us, Bible Baptist Church, let's give by faith, not by sight. Let's not, let's not ever get to where we just give with what we can see to give. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Ask God what He wants you to do. Ask God what, what would please you in the offering. And what He tells you to do, do it. You'll be glad you did. Because He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. God can do the unbelievable, He can do the impossible, and He certainly can do the unusual if we just have faith in Him. Amen? Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you so much, Lord, for allowing us to have faith in You. Thank You, Lord, that we can grow our faith. Thank You, Lord, that You allow us to please You by faith. And Lord, I pray that today we'd have a number of people that would say, I want to live by faith, not by sight. I want to have a great level of confidence in what God can do in, through, and for me. What an exciting life to live by faith. Not, not doing what we can see to do. Well, I'll see what I can do. but asking what by faith God would want me to do. And I pray that each of us, when we face our offering today, will ask you, what by faith do you want me to do, God? And we would obey you. So many have done that in the past, Lord. I pray they'll do it again for this special offering. And I pray this morning, Lord, if any here today has never put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior, and realize that He died for them on the cross. And they've never fully trusted Him alone as their Savior, that they would put their faith and trust in Him this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. I wonder how many believers here today.
say, Pastor, the Lord spoke to my heart this morning about a life of faith, that God can do the unusual, God can do the unbelievable, and God can do the impossible. Mark 11, Luke 11, John 11. You say, Pastor, the Lord has spoken to my heart. I don't want to be a live-by-sight Christian. I want to be a live-by-faith Christian. Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart this morning. Pray for me today. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Say, pray for me. Praise the Lord. That's wonderful. God bless you. You may put them down. Who's here today would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. You talk about accepting Jesus as your Savior and trusting Him alone. I don't know that I've ever done that. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you or call you out, but I will pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up right now and put it back down and say, Pastor, that's me. Pray for me today. I'm not sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to be sure about that. All right. The message was to believers then. And if God has spoken to your heart today, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to him. The altar is going to be open for you to come. Spend a few moments with the Lord. Maybe it will be what will you have me to do. Maybe you're facing an impossibility in your life. And you've got to say, God, I need the faith to trust you for the impossible. Maybe it's just an unusual situation. You say, I need to trust you for something unusual here. Maybe it's something that's just unbelievable. And you're going to trust him for the unbelievable. But have faith in God. Not only to save you, but to sanctify you. Walk by faith, not by sight. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts. I pray your will be done now in these next few moments of invitation. I pray that each one who you've spoken to their heart, they'd respond to you. And holy decisions we've made for you at these altars this morning. Have thine own way, Lord, in our midst, please. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet if you would. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond Have to him this morning, will you please? Way. Have That's thine right. own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, master to me. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weak. I pray, power, all power, surely is thine, touch me and heal me, Savior divine, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, hold o'er my being, absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only always living in me. Father, I thank you now for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for meeting with us, for speaking to our hearts through your word. Oh, God, help us to be men and women of faith that we would live lives that would be pleasing in your sight because we walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, remind us that you're the God of the impossible, you're the God of the unusual, you're the God of the unbelievable. Lord, help us to have faith in you. We love you. We pray your blessing upon each one now as we go our separate ways and Lord, as you prepare us this afternoon for what you have for us tonight in the service, bring us back safely for the evening service. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.
Now, don't forget, the uh, Moreland's have their things in the fellowship hall, so head on uh, through there if you would, see if there's anything that might be a, a help to you and you'd be a help to them as you purchase that. I do want, Emily, come on up here. I want to give you your check right now, okay? That's faith, amen? amen. I don't believe God will give it. And if we have more, this is for $500. If we have more come in, we'll give her more, okay? It'll all go to you to be a help and a blessing, okay? God bless you, Emily. Thank you. None of that goes to pay your driver for driving you over here, okay? <laughs> All right. Go buy Blue Jacket tickets or something like that. So. All right. Uh, I think that's all we've got. Let's sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. All right, Brother Bob? Oops. 